Hello everyone, welcome back to part two of our discussion of chapter three. The first part we talked about things that are included and how they are included on the tax return. Now we're going to talk about things that are specifically, remember all income and less specifically mentioned in the tax law is included. So there's some places where it's ex specifically excluded. Um, from the tax, from our income. So first one, um, fringe benefits. Now we're talking about things on top of your regular salary that employers provide for their employees. And they typically, most of them, have to follow non-discrimination rules, meaning the yeah, you can't provide them for just certain employees. You can't just provide them for the the top level employees and not for everybody. They have to be for basically all employees. And the you can see why the tax law would do that. They they are providing this opportunity to benefit, you know, to to give benefits to employees that are not taxable to them, but only if the company provide them for everybody. So one example, okay, is no additional cost services provided to an employee. This typically comes up in uh, airlines or in other types of travel situations where an employee can go on an airplane if you, you know, if there is no other uh, paying customers. So what is usually referred to as standby or space available they can do that and the airline can provide that even though that's a benefit that will not be included in their income the income of the employee where it gets a little more complicated and airlines provide it for not only the employee but sometimes for family members uh, and that does not quite fit and so some part of it has to be included in income but if it's just for the employee then it's not they have to be it has to be in their business so the other thing is I can't provide you know if I am a manufacturer I can't provide uh, airline tickets it has to be the airline that provides that you have to be in the business of doing that and you can provide it for your employees The, the, the theory behind that is they, it doesn't cost the airline any more money to put you on that plane. They're already going there. So discounts, you can provide a certain discount. However, you can't, there's some limits in that it can't be more than your gross profit. So if you normally sell things for a 30% markup, meaning that 30% more than it costs you, then that's the maximum you can kind of get. You can't give it to employees, you can't sell it to employees for less than what you paid for it is basically the idea. Uh, services where there's not a specific, you know, price you paid, it the discount is a 20% maximum. So you can't get too carried away with that, but you can provide some very valuable discount to employees, again, at your particular uh, store. Qualified transportation benefits, bus passes, parking spaces, things like that, that facilitate employees coming to work, that sort of thing. Again, oh, there's a limit. Okay, so if you do that for an employee, they do not have to include an income. It's not included in their income unless you go over $270 per month. So if the value or the, the is given more than that then the additional part would be included in income so if your the value you're providing for employees was three hundred dollars a month then they would you would have to include thirty dollars a month for 12 months or whatever time period they work for you in their income because the maximum is 270 that can be excluded and we're talking about things that can be excluded um, some de minimis benefits Company picnics, 
holiday turkeys, cop copies being used for personal, I think the copier at work, things, some of those things um, are what's considered de minimis benefits, too small to track and include an income and therefore excludable. Other fringe benefits uh, have, you know, some other specific limitations, life insurance. Employer can pay for life insurance for employees for term life insurance, group term life insurance for up to $50,000. If you provide more life insurance than that, and this is life insurance that's gonna pay out to the employee's family if something happens to them, not to the company itself. That's a different scenario, but this is just Life insurance that would pay out to the to the employee's family, up to fifty thousand dollars, and it's not included in income. If you go over fifty thousand, then the tax law actually designates based on age, okay, um, how much the value is per thousand dollars of coverage over fifty thousand. And so you calculate that, and that's how much has to be included in income, not actually how much is paid for the insurance. It's actually determined by um, the IRS based on the formula on the age of the employee. That could be offset. Sometimes a company might, uh, and this is a case with any of these benefits if they provided eighty thousand dollars but made the employee pay something towards it so you would calculate the value of the thirty thousand over the fifty and then you would subtract out whatever the employee paid actually reimburse the company for because the rest of it would would be uh, the difference would be included in income for the employee and the upside of all of this all of these are these are costs that the employer pays and gets to deduct on their taxes but the employee does not include it in their income uh, educational systems up to 5250 and again a limit and but very little in the limit in terms of what you can cover basically if you set up a plan and basically make it available for all your employees that you're going to pay for them to take classes it can be any classes it can be cooking classes it can be getting them better prepared for their job but it doesn't have to be all right then and you set it up where you, they come and bring their their transcripts or whatever what they paid and you reimburse them 5250 is an included income, even though that's a benefit even that, to the employee. And they expanded that uh, in 2020 to include 5250 of student loans could be paid. So even if it's not a current class you're taking, but classes you took in the past and took out a loan for, and you have uh, student loans, you can pay 5250 of that. All right, um, dependent care. You can exclude up to 5,000 that they pay, the employer pays for child care or dependent care. All right, but it can't be more than the earned income of the employee. Now, other things that are excluded specifically in the tax law. Scholarships and fellowships. You have to be a dis degree seeking student. That means that you're actually going after, you can't be just piddling around. Okay. You've got to be seeking a degree. All right. And it can't be for payment for your services. So if you just got a scholarship, or a fellowship 
because you're a great person and they love you and that sort of thing. But if the, you are paid for teaching a class as a, uh, as a teacher assistant or something like that, then that is income. But the scholarship part, which is because of maybe your past uh, academics or because of need, that is not. All right, we have qualified tuition programs that we withdraw, we put money in when the kids are young and then when they get college age, they can pull it out. It's usually sponsored by the state called 529 plans. You can, that's not income when you pull it out and use it for college, at least up to $10,000. Life insurance, very important. Life insurance proceeds. When someone dies and the life insurance pays the beneficiary, the income to that beneficiary, that life insurance is not taxable. It does seem kind of um, reasonable to not burden someone who's dealing with the grief of the loss of a loved one with taxes on that income. But the question I get all the time is what about gifts and inheritances? Different from income, gifts are out of the generosity of their, your heart, okay? Inheritances is what they leave you when someone passes away. Not the life insurance part, we already talked about that, but what they leave behind, for instance, money in their bank account, uh, houses, property, things like that, those are not taxable income. Where this can get a little tricky is with either life insurance or these, if they, those things continue to earn income. So for instance, your life insurance, instead of getting paid all at once, it goes into an account and pays you over time some part of that is the life insurance and some part of that is interest, like we talked about in things that are included. And so that would have to be separated into the income part from interest and the life insurance part, which is the part that you get tax without being part of tax. And the same thing with inheritance. If they leave you productive assets that are earning income, then that income from that is taxable. The receipt of the asset is not. Compensation for sickness or injury. This is usually comes from some form of insurance, right? That is paying you for, you know, help you know, covering the cost of going to the doctor, that sort of thing. That's not income, even though it's a benefit to you. Now, if it is uh, certain forms, okay, uh, it can be if can be income if it's if it's paid because you missed work, okay, uh, instead of because of an injury. So, for instance, if you had a serious injury, maybe you severed uh, uh, your your hand off, okay? Many places you have insurance that will pay you a set amount for that injury. That would not be income. But if they pay you for $100 for every day you miss of work, because it's replacing income, that would be income because it's compensation for missing work, not for the specific injury or sickness. Child support, not income, not deductible to the person paying it, not income to the person receiving it. Welfare benefits, various forms of welfare benefits are generally not uh, taxable, uh, but unemployment insurance is included in income, although in, during the pandemic, it was temporarily excluded for 2020. And employer can provide adoption assistance uh, up to limits 
that mean the employer could either reimburse costs or pay the costs directly, and that would not be income to the employer. All right, we talked about savings bond interest. We talked about it being included in income back in part one. But there is this law, this rule that says it's not taxable if it's used to pay qualified higher education expenses for the taxpayer, their spouse, or dependent children, kind of treating them all together, all right? The amounts you get, remember these tax um, savings bonds, these savings bonds, you get the whole proceeds, meaning you buy them for $50 and then at the end of the 10 or 15, 20 years, you get $100. To have it fully excluded from tax, you have to spend all 100 of that on education expenses. If you only pay, spend 80 of that, then you're not going to get only 80% of the interest could be excluded. All right, so that's that's a key, key thing to remember. Okay, and the limitation starts to go away. We talked a little bit about phase outs. This will phase out if your income is too high, your your AGI. So you, this type of saving for, for education requires you to, to put money away well before the. Um, student is going to be go to college and and you have to say, say no or believe that your income was not going to be high enough that it will go away before time comes when you actually get to use this benefit so this is a hard uh, one to justify actually utilizing there's better ways to save for education that have better tax implications than this one all right now, interesting situation where you actually loan someone money for low interest, okay? The person receiving interest is receiving maybe zero interest but maybe, or maybe a low amount of interest. We're going to have to, according to the law, impute that interest the, that at a more market rate except where there's small, very small amounts involved or where there's very short time periods, okay? Gift loans, another situation where income may be imputed but not included in income because if, if it's a gift, then it's not included in income. Original issue discount is a little bit uh, tricky. This is a situation very similar to those savings bonds where they're, you're investing, and this is the way it is with most uh, treasury bonds or treasury bills that you buy from the US government. You buy the bond and then you turn it in after a certain amount of time and get the full face value. So you buy it for $95, after four months, you turn it in and get $100, okay? Because you bought it at 95, that's an original issue discount. It's the difference between the acquisition price, what you paid for it, and the maturity value. Because it's not a specifically savings bond, you don't get a choice. So remember earlier, we talked about Series E savings bonds. You got to choose whether to report that income each year or at the end. You don't get that choice if it's not a savings bond. You have to report that amount of interest each year. And the way you calculate that is you take the uh, amount you paid, all right, and then you multiply it by the yield to maturity that it was sold for. And that figures out the interest for year one. Add that to your 
amount you paid, okay, and calculate the interest again, same yield to maturity, and add that on. And each year, even though you're not going to get any of that interest until the end, when you're going to get the whole thing, you still have to report it in income and still have to pay taxes on it, even though you don't have any cash. Okay? You don't have to do that if it's tax exempt, or as we talked about, U.S. savings bonds specifically, those things are less than a year. Okay? And if there's a non business loan, $10,000 or less. All right, and you do it on that original issue discount. And I can't, I'm never seen any two individuals come up with that arrangement on their own.